everyone, welcome back. I'm Witch Hazel and on this channel I like to share some of my witchy life and experiences. So we have a slight change of locale for this video and that is because I needed a table. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about herbs and specifically tea blending. So I'm not sure yet how long this video will be. I will try not to make it too long, but in the interest of that, let's get started, shall we? All right, so I love tea. I think many of us witchy folk do. It's almost like a requirement to be a witch in some cases. <laughs> and I, I have my tea here, but I, I have a secondary reason for loving tea. Now it's a great thing just on its own and also for any of us who enjoy working with herbs, doing other things with herbs, then it's great to have herbs around that we can just mix up a tea at some point if we want to. I think I have an old video on herbs. <clears throat> I'll have to take a look at it. I'll link it below if I can find it. But recently, and by recently, I mean within the past couple of weeks. However, this has been ongoing for several years. I went to see a doctor about my digestion because I've been having issues with it for years now, and I have not been able to figure out how to fix it on my own and decided I needed a, a secondary opinion, someone else's idea of what I should do. On the upside, most of what she would have suggested I'm already doing, so I guess that's good. On the downside, it's not working, so that's a problem. And one thing that I decided I need to do more of is making my teas. A couple of reasons for this. One, for anyone on any sort of financial restriction. It's very cost effective to know how to blend your own teas and work with your own herbs. I usually, I am lucky that I have a natural grocers just down the street and they sell herbs in these bulk um, baggies very cheaply. If you do not have some sort of natural grocers near you, then your regular supermarket, go down the spice aisle. <laughs> go down the spice aisle, you will find an amazing assortment of things. If you are not particularly constrained by finance, you can go the route of something like mountain rose herbs. I really like them. Um, all of my mountain rose herbs are probably expired by now. <laughs> they are quite old. But I'm not getting rid of them because even expired herbs, old herbs, all that really means is it's not going to work as well. And these are pretty great for other things like non-medicinal things. You can add these herbs still to incenses and candle uh, preparations and that sort of thing. The reason I'm bringing up finances is because it has come to my attention, and I really, really dislike this, but in my state at least, it's different for other states, I'm in Colorado, but in Colorado, if you are receiving food benefits, the EBT, SNAP card, you pretty much cannot buy tea at the supermarket. Why? Because almost all teas these days are labeled as health supplements or medicinal and the tea companies do this because it's more trendy uh, labeling labeling what is this um lavender lavender tea as a sleep aid somehow makes it magically more than just lavender tea and increases sales Unfortunately, for the people who depend on state assistance, labeling it a sleep aid now makes it a supplement and therefore you are not allowed to buy it with your food stamp money. I really dislike that. So it becomes, if you are a person who likes tea, 
it becomes very almost necessary to learn how to mix your own teas. For me and my digestive woes, I know that I am looking for two types of herbs. Bitters, which the doctor did recommend to add into my diet. For some reason I hadn't thought of it, so that was good. And carminatives. What are those two things? Well, they, they are very similar in how they function, slightly different. Bitters will basically kind of work to get the digestive system moving a little bit more. It works to encourage the secretion of digestive enzymes and uh, digestive fluids within the body. So that's how the bitters work. Those are good to take before a meal to stimulate the appetite and get your digestive system working. Carminatives, on the other hand, also have play a part in encouraging the digestion, but it's not as, not quite as stimulating, I would say. Carminatives are very often used in after-meal aperitifs, like cordials um, and, and things like that. And those, and they are used more to kind of settle the stomach. <laughs> settle the stomach and the digestion if you've had something that's too heavy, that is causing your digestion to work a little bit more than you would like it to. But both of them have this function of aiding the digestive system. So with that in mind, I have these adorable little jars. I collect jars, by the way. I, I always keep jars. It's becoming a little bit of a problem. <laughs> But I wanted to show you this little bitty jar. This is perfect for mixing up a sampler. If you, if you think, okay, I want something, I want a tea that has this and that quality, but I'm not really sure about ratios, then mix up just a small amount and sample it. See how you like it. If there's something off in it, if you think it can be tweaked, then do that on the next round. This is not a huge amount so if you get the get the amounts off then it's not the end of the world so find yourself a jar <laughs> these are petite pot it's a rice pudding little rice pudding jar petite pot and figure out which herbs you want to use you can always look up, you can easily find lists of herbs online. I have a list from the doctor. Many of these I already had in the cupboard anyway, so that's good. There are certain on here that I already knew as carminatives. Uh, fennel, anise, and coriander. Because I have a recipe for schnapps that belonged to my grandmother, and I think the recipe was actually her father's. When he ran a cafe and it uses those three herbs in the recipe. So there are also quite a few kitchen herbs on here. Cinnamon, oregano, pepper, rosemary, thyme. You can, you can find a lot of things just in the spice aisle. So you're going to want to choose herbs. I would say if you are new to tea blending, stick to two or three. Even start out with simple, start out with one and see which teas that you like, which flavors you like, which ones you find to be very strong, which ones you find to be very weak, and what effect they have on you. Certain things, fenugreek. Fenugreek is known for its wonderful effect on the hair to help your hair growth. So that's why I decided to try it. I was having, through my digestive and nutritive issues, I, I was losing a lot of my hair. So what I found out the hard way is fenugreek is very much a diuretic, meaning you lose a lot of water with this one. So I, I can't use it. I can't do it. Except for I can make a paste for my hair, a conditioning paste, but I can't internally take it. So that's good to know. Find these things out. Another, another one that has similar properties, nettle leaf. 
nettle is amazing. It is very, very nutritive. It has tons of vitamins, minerals. It is great for you. It is a diuretic. It, you will, you take too much of it, it's going to dehydrate you. So be careful with this one. I know for, my, for myself, I know that I am sensitive to diuretics. So whenever using these herbs, I want to make it the least amount possible in my mix, right? So keep those things in mind. That said, what am I going to mix up today? Oh, before I get to that, a good thing to keep on hand or have bookmarked in your on your computer when you're looking up herbs and their properties, have some sort of a medicinal medical reference. I like this one. It's Mosby's Handbook of Herbs and Natural Supplements. And I use it just because Mosby's, they make a drug guide that nurses use. And when I was a nurse, I had Mosby's drug guide. So I already knew the brand, I liked it. So when I saw that they had a herbs and natural supplements option, I bought that. So I keep this for reference. All right, choosing herbs. I was initially going to mix up two options for you today, but for some unknown reason, I do not have my anise and coriander. I have caraway, which is also good. I'm not sure why I don't have anise because I know I had it in the past. I had all my ingredients for the schnapps. So I'm not going to mix that one today. But what I will mix is a basically a sleepy time tea, a nighttime tea. I have chamomile flowers and I have lavender. And I think I will try, I was going to do just these two to start, but I think I'm going to add a little bit of fennel. And then all three of these are carminatives. So all of them are going to help my digestion and I am hoping they will also help me to relax because I believe a big part of what ails me is constant stress. So going off of this idea, I'm going to mix these three. And the way I'm going to do it is I know that lavender is a bit stronger than chamomile, taste-wise. Uh, it's just got more essential oils. So chamomile is going to be my, my base. I'm going to have more of this one. And then my middle, middle note here is going to be lavender. Fennel also a little bit goes a long way. So I'm just adding a little bit of fennel just for some extra taste because I love fennel. And I'm going to start with that. Now, how do we do measurements? The way I learned it, I learned, I, I did go through an herbalism certification course. I did complete that. I did the classroom setting type of thing. But then I've also taken more informal community herbal courses. And what I love is kind of grandma's way of doing it. It's not entirely eyeballing it, but you can do that. The important thing to keep in mind is parts. When you see recipes for tea or other herbal recipes, it will often say things like one part this, two parts that. Oops. Well, how much is a part? That's up to you and how much you're making, how well you know the recipe. I w I'm going to use a teaspoon. This teaspoon is one part for me. And to keep things simple, even for my smallest amount, the fennel, I am not going to make it smaller than one teaspoon because I don't want to deal with halves and eighths and quarters and not going not to gonna deal with that. Um, but whatever you choose to be one part, keep that consistent in your mixing. Okay, so let me mix this up here. I'm going to start with the chamomile. So I've got two parts chamomile in my jar here, and you can see it's already pretty full. So I'm going to start with that. I'm 
going to put one part lavender and notice I've already messed things up because the fennel is going to be the same as the lavender. But this is a starting point, so I've got one part lavender there in there. And then one part fennel. Once I get each of those in there, I'll see how much space I have. And I will probably add one additional part each of the lavender and the chamomile, if it'll fit. I think it will. I've still got a little space in there. So that will then give me three parts chamomile, two parts lavender, one part fennel. And I think that is a good basic recipe to start with. And it is so great that I decided to do this with you because I totally forgot to bring my notebook over here. And that is important. Do as I say, not as I do. Always, always, when you are mixing new recipes, write it down. <laughs> write it down so you know what you did. If you hit on the winner of teas, you're going to want to do it again at some point. <laughs> so, all right, three parts chamomile, two parts lavender, one part fennel. There's what it looks like. And then this looks very pretty, but I'm going to want all of them together in my tea. So I'm just going to mix that around like so. This works better if you don't overfill the jar. And then dosage. How much of this am I going to want to use when I make my tea? For a standard 8 ounce cup of tea, I would say 6 to 8 ounces of water, you want to have one teaspoon. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it's, it's <laughs> one teaspoon. Yes, that's what I use. I use teaspoons. One teaspoon per um, glass of, of water. Now, of course, if you have like my, my regular kitchen mug is 12 ounces. So what do I do? I just use a pretty darn heaping uh, spoonful of tea. But again, start out with something consistent. If you're testing these teas and how well they work, start with a teaspoon. If you want to add more, that's fine. Be careful of which herbs you use. Most herbs are going to be fine. You're not really going to be able to overdo it. But again, keep in mind those particular qualities of some herbs, like the diuretics. You don't want to overdo it on those. Those will mess you up if you overdo it. <laughs> um, and so some herbs, the non-traditional, well, they're traditional, but not, um, not in the supermarket traditional. Things like ladies mantle, mugwort. These are, mugwort especially is very popular among witches, but, uh, but be careful and make sure that you know what the properties are. You don't want to overdo it. Same thing with lady, ladies mantle or any, or any of these that you wouldn't necessarily find easily in your regular supermarket. There's probably a reason why. All right, so now this video is very much long. Hopefully I can shorten it just a little bit in the editing, but um, why don't I make it a little bit longer and tell you about some of the herbs that I have on hand. I have mugwort and ladies mantle are actually from several years ago I was having problems with a lot of pretty bad cramping around a certain time of month, you know? So I made a tincture uh, with these. I started out with simples and then I mixed it and this was very helpful for me for the cramping. Um, for my regular teas, I love rose hips and hibiscus, hibiscus flowers. Um, these are both very good if you want to do something like a Valentine's tea or a, a love tea, aphrodisiac tea, anything like that. These are very good and the, 
added benefit, they both have a lot of vitamin C. So I, I just like them for their flavor. <laughs> but lots of vitamin C, so these are good. What else do I have on hand here? Ah, my favorite. Sometimes you will mix up some teas that are very good for you, but they don't necessarily taste all that great. Uh, examples would be oat straw, oat straw and alfalfa. Alfalfa is great for vitamins, minerals. It's a very neat. These are nutritive. If you're looking for uh, the particular character qualities of these, these are nutritive. You have your vitamins and minerals in them. Oat straw, alfalfa, alfalfa especially, you cannot go wrong. You can't really overdo it with this one, but it doesn't really taste like much. So if you want to mix up, mix those up a little bit, and actually what I do, I will mix the alfalfa, oat straw, a little bit of nettle because nettle's very good, but again, it's too drying for me maybe a couple of additional things and to make it taste better I add in licorice root. I love licorice root. <laughs> so that is one option. If you do not like licorice root you can add things like um, peppermint, spearmint, um, I don't know what else. Anything that has a little bit better taste to it. All right. For my hair, I will often do tea rinses for my hair. And when I do that, I will use lavender, which I already showed you, and I will use rosemary. Lavender and rosemary are very good for the hair. They both have, well, the lavender has very good antibacterial qualities. Rosemary has been used forever on end for hair growth and hair uh, darkening. Um, oh, another good one for flavor, cardamom. I love cardamom. And I learned a little trick from my uncle who would always take a couple of cardamom seeds and crush them up and put them in with, when he was making his coffee. That tastes great. So I will do that sometimes. Or if you cook up an uh, Indian rice pudding, cardamom is a must. So I love cardamom. And then... If you are someone who maybe wants to try a, an herbal decaf coffee, good herbs for that are dandelion root and burdock root. Also chicory. I used to have roast chicory. What happened to that? At one point I gave away all of my herbs. I guess it went that way. Burdock, dandelion, chicory. The thing to watch out for with these, though, they're all very good. They've got that very earthy flavor to them that makes them good for coffee substitutes. And you're going to want to, um, these are roots, so you're going to want to, I can't remember the name right now, but you basically boil them, the herb in the water for longer. It's not just a, a steeping like you do with tea, but very, very good, very tasty. And the thing to keep in mind though that these typically work on the liver. They are used very often for cleansing the, the liver, which is good to cleanse any toxins out. But again, anything to do with the liver, you want to be a little bit careful, so make sure you do your research first. And other than that, the only other one I have in here is my bay leaves. Um, I use these for cooking, mostly. They are also very good for spell work. You can write uh, things on the bay leaves and then burn them. Works well. I point these out because there is another very similar looking leaf that I love. It's called uh, myrtle. Um, and you can get lemon myrtle leaves. And lemon myrtle, hibiscus, um, or even just myrtle hibiscus with a little lemon peel. It's great. Wonderful, wonderful tea. Very tasty. So as you can see, there are many, many options for us witchy folk who love our herbs. If you are able to grow your own herbs, that's even better. I unfortunately cannot. I don't have good enough 
light in my home but you know if you if you can become even minimally adept at mixing your own teas you can start making tinctures you can make flavored honeys you can do so much with common kitchen herbs and it's going to be so very helpful to your health you can mix up very many uh, medicinal items using herbs so that was a little primer on mixing teas i hope that was interesting to you guys and if you have any other questions or if you would like to hear about any other part of herb working uh, if it's pantry witching if it's in the kitchen in spell work anything let me know let me know in the comments if you have any questions about getting started with herbs because I would love to chat more about it. So until next time, everyone, thank you and blessed be.